the webinar. I'm really excited that you're here to join us. Um, so my name is Julia McLeod and I'm the Outreach Director for the Harpswell Heritage Land Trust. Um, this is one of a series of Stories of Change webinars that we're hosting this year. I'll show you a few of the next ones that are coming up. On May 10th, we have Promoting Equity and Inclusion in the Environmental Movement with Amara Ifiji. On June 24th, we have Bailey Island to the Barrier Reef, Sea Stars as Sentinels of a Changing World with Jonathan Allen. And on July 22nd, we have Words and Watersheds with Gary Lawless. So we have a lot of interesting speakers this year. We'll have one a month for the whole year, and I hope you'll join us for another one. Um, I stop sharing my screen. So just a little bit about tonight's um, presentation. I'm really thrilled to have John Banks, the director of the Department of Natural Resources for the Penobscot Indian Nation to talk to us about the Penobscot River restoration. Um, I am, you, know, you might notice that I'm recording this, but I can't actually see you or hear you. So don't worry if you're, you know, doing something, eating dinner while you're watching this. Um, but I would love to hear your questions. So you are welcome to type questions in the chat at any time during the presentation. And I will ask those questions of John at the end. So if you see the bottom of your screen, there's a little chat bubble. You just click on that and you can type your questions right in there anytime and we'll get to them. Um, so I think without anything else, I will turn it over to John. Thank you. Well, thank you, Julia, and thanks to the Land Trust for inviting me to speak with you tonight. Um, and thanks for all the great work that uh, you guys do. And it looks like you got a pretty good program of uh, presentations coming up. Um, so again, thank you for having me and I'm very happy to be here to talk about one of my favorite things, which is the Penobscot River. I am a uh, Penobscot tribal member, and I uh, have been uh, employed by the tribe as the natural resources director since uh, 1980. Went to school at Orono, graduated um, in the forestry program in 1980. And that was right when the uh, 1980 Maine Indian Land Claims Settlement Act was uh, just being finalized in Congress. And so, uh, it was good timing on my part, I guess. I was uh, just finishing up my forestry degree and the uh, tribe was looking to hire uh, folks to set up their various land management programs in anticipation of um, uh, getting some of its Aboriginal lands returned. And so uh, here we are now, we've, uh, we've developed a natural resources department uh, at the tribe, uh, consisting of all of the, you know, all of the standard natural resource programs, uh, forestry and fish and wildlife, uh, water resources. Um, uh, we do have our own game warden service. Uh, as a result of the Land Claims Settlement Act, we have um, the authority to regulate the taking of wildlife within the Indian lands, Penobscot lands. So we have our own warden service. But one of the big uh, priorities of the tribe and the Natural Resources Department has always been the, um, the ecological uh, condition of the Penobscot River watershed. Um, that is really the kind of the central artery of the tribe or the, the central homeland. Uh, so the tribe had, you know, used the watershed for thousands of years uh, to carry on a, you know, a subsistence lifestyle uh, with, the, with the forests really meeting all of their needs for a very long time, all made possible by the Penobscot River and its watershed. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about one of our exciting projects that we've been involved with, uh, probably the most exciting conservation project, which is the uh, restoration of some of the migratory species of fish that uh, had been pretty much eliminated from the 
from the watershed due to the uh, building of hydroelectric facilities uh, without adequate uh, fish passage and without adequate um, consideration for other habitat impacts. So the, the fish runs were pretty much eliminated. Uh, the first dam in uh, Bangor, uh, they were talking about how the first uh, spring uh, runs of fish after the dam was built, uh, you know, they, they met a, a concrete barrier that they couldn't pass and uh, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of migratory fish died and they, uh, it says in the history books how there was a stench that you could smell throughout all of the Bangor area just from these dying uh, fish. Um, so that was then, a lot of things have changed. Uh, you know, the state and federal agencies have been involved with uh, fish restoration programs. There's been a lot of a lot of good things going on to, to try to bring back some of these migratory species. And so the um, tonight I'm going to talk about the Penobscot River Restoration Project, which was about uh, started in 1999 officially, uh, where the tribe got together with several NGOs and began negotiating uh, with the uh, hydro company, which was, um, was Pennsylvania Power and Light at the time. Pennsylvania Power and Light had uh, bought uh, most of Bangor Hydro's uh, uh, generating assets. So I'm going to share my screen and hopefully here, and I do have some slides to show so you can look at some, some nice pretty pictures instead of looking at me all night here. All righty. So this shows the Penobscot River watershed in relationship to the state of Maine. Uh, you can see that it's about um, roughly a third of the land area of the state of Maine. It's the largest watershed in the state the second largest in New England, second to the Connecticut. John, I'm not sure if it's just me, but I actually don't see your PowerPoint. Sorry to interrupt. I oh. see um, our website, the Harpsville Heritage Land Trust, which maybe you also had up on your screen. Okay. Um, it for other people too, or is this just me? <laughs> let me try something else here. Uh-huh, there it is. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so here's the Penobscot River watershed. And so, yeah, this is up in, you know, up in the headwaters, uh, which it originates on both sides of Katahdin with the, the branches. East Branch and the West Branch, they come together at Medway. And then uh, all the way to the ocean is just a shot of uh, Penobscot Bay and part of the estuary. And these are little alewives that uh, have been a, a target of, for restoration because uh, of their ecological value. Uh, they're extremely important uh, for the general ecological health of all of our rivers in Maine. Uh, they bring in marine drive nutrients and they're a food source for the, the whole food chain. Just about everybody eats alewives. And they say, by they, I mean fisheries professionals that I've spoken with have said that uh, out of a, a thousand alewives, you only need four. Uh, to continue to continue the run. 
because of their high uh, fecundity rate. And so out of a thousand L wives on average, that's 996 available for everybody else. Uh, salmon are certainly a, a target species. Uh, the Atlantic salmon runs had uh, sustained the Penobscot nation for thousands of years. Uh, the books talk about tribal members netting and spearing Atlantic salmon by the tens of thousands, uh, right at the site of the, where the Milford Dam is now. And river restoration doesn't only benefit fish, obviously, it uh, benefits the whole ecosystem from the very top predators, uh, eagles and ospreys and humans, uh, all the way down to the smallest uh, aquatic life, the insect life. And people, people benefit from river restoration. Uh, recreational canoeing, obviously, uh, fishing, uh, commercial fishing and recreational fishing and family outings. And uh, the first caught salmon, Atlantic salmon at the Bangor pool, Bangor salmon pool, used to go to the president every year. Uh, starting, I guess, in 1912. So that was a uh, kind of a big deal and really uh, put a lot of uh, attention to the Atlantic salmon run on the Penobscot. So now I'm gonna talk more specifically about the project and what was involved. Starting at the first dam and the lowermost dam, which is the VZ Dam or was the VZ Dam, is uh, right here uh, in between Bangor and Orono. Uh, and that was the historic head of tide uh, right there. So uh, that dam has been removed. That was removed in 2013. Going up river, the Great Works Dam uh, is right in Old Town at the site of uh, a paper mill. Uh, the Great Works Dam was taken out in 2012. Uh, and we took the Great Works Dam out first. So the VZ Dam would stay in place for one year because it has a fish trap in it right here, a fish way and a fish trap. So they trap all of the fish here and they, they used to truck them uh, either to the hatchery or upriver to be released. Um, and so the VZ Dam uh, came out in 2013, the Great Works Dam came out in 2012. And this is right here is uh, just above the Great Works Dam where it was is uh, where Indian Island is. That's the seat of government for the Penobscot Nation as well as where all of the administrative offices are and uh, many of the tribal members live there in the community on Indian Island. And the reservation is uh, a whole bunch of islands in the river, over 200 in total uh, that extend upriver from Indian Island. Indian Island's about 300 acres. And this next island up is Orson Island. It's about 1,500 acres. That's uh, the largest reserva reservation island. Moving upriver, Milford is just below where the reservation starts and Milford Dam uh, stayed. The, uh, the company, which was PPL at the time, uh, wanted to keep that particular asset. And they um, also had their um, administrative offices there. And so 
Milford now with great works and VZ gone, great works, I mean, Milford now becomes the critical, uh, the first kind of blockage for fish runs that are trying to get to their spawning areas. Um, so what happened at Milford, and there'll be more about this a little later, uh, they built uh, quite an extensive uh, fish lift. Um, it's like a big elevator type thing that um, does pass most fish that can find it. And then moving upriver to Howland, uh, this is the uh, where the confluence of the Piscataquis River and the Penobscot here come together in Howland. And so this uh, subwatershed, the Piscataquis River drainage, uh, flows in from the west. And it has about, about roughly about 20% of the best uh, salmon and trout habitat in the whole watershed. So it was really key to address that particular uh, obstruction. And so we worked with the town of Howland. They wanted to keep the dam in place and keep their impoundment in place because they had developed kind of a recreational industry in the impoundment behind the dam, doing like snowmobile races in the summer, in the winter time and things like that. And um, so we worked with the town and we were able to actually construct a uh, nature-like bypass around the dam. Uh, and that way, I think uh, everybody could, could come together and get what they wanted. Um, yeah, there's a, that was a, a diagram of the, the design for the, fish bypass channel, here's the dam here. Um, so this slide shows the two, the two aspects of the project, the energy side and the fisheries side. Uh, so in terms of uh, hydropower, the project as a whole, the whole system actually generates more power now than it did uh, before the dams, before the three dams were decommissioned. And they were able to accomplish that uh, through a number of tweaks at the remaining dams. For instance, they added a new, uh, an, another turbine in the Milford Dam. Uh, they added another small generating station in the Stillwater Dam. And they uh, retooled uh, the Arno Dam as well. And the West Enfield Dam, they raised the head pond by one foot. Uh, so they gained an additional roughly 10% generating capacity there. So, you know, we talk about this project as being a win 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 project. And I think, um, I think it really is. Um, you know, hydropower by itself isn't, you know, isn't really bad compared to other ways of generating electricity. It's burning fossil fuels and uh, things like that. Uh, if you can address the environmental concerns. And in this particular project, there was, uh, there was enough, uh, enough circumstances coming together at, the right time uh, to allow this to happen. Um, many of these dams were under relicensing and had been a, the light or the license had been uh, issued and they were under appeal for various reasons. So the company was interested in you know negotiating uh, with us to um, be able to you know, do some of this replacement power on this side, on the left side. Um, and we were able to get some, you know, some improvements in, in fisheries and ecological restoration. So, um, yeah, here's the map of 
habitat before and after. Uh, they estimate it in, uh, improved access for sea run fish uh, for nearly 2,000 river miles in total. Uh, so this is kind of a complicated slide, but it's kind of basically a summary of what I just went through. You have uh, in red here, these highlighted areas is uh, where uh, some of the species could get to before the dams. Uh, and again, the, the reservation starts here in Old Town. So prior to the project, uh, very few, if any, of the original suite of migratory fish could even get to the reservation, uh, let alone get to their spawning areas. Uh, some pictures before, this looks like the Great Works Dam uh, before, obviously. And uh, this was the day of the Great Works Dam removal. We had a ceremonial event. Uh, this on the left here is Laura Rose Day. She was the executive director of the project. Uh, this fella here standing next to Butch is the uh, Secretary of Interior, Secretary Salazar. And this is Butch Phillips, our tribal elder, performing the ceremony. And um, on your right, we have the state uh, DMR commissioner, Pat Kelleher. It was a good day. And here's what it looks like now. <clears throat> Uh, some important uh, rips were, were revealed. These are uh, very important uh, sites to the tribe and the pe general people from the area. Um, I suppose that there's a reason they were named Shad Rips. And actually, since the project has been completed, there has been a shad fishery reestablished at this site. Uh, this was the uh, the Vesey Dam, and you can see the old fishway here. Uh, this was a denial type fishway, which passed some species, but it it really, I, I think the the fisheries folks uh, mentioned that since they put this this uh, fish ladder in place, they had counted. Uh, less than a dozen American shad that were able to negotiate this fishway. And um, so American shad are a very difficult species to pass. And um, at the Milford fish lift, I think they passed like 1,200 in one day uh, when it was first put in. So this was the start of the deconstruction of the Beasy Dam. Uh, you can see the uh, excavators over here just starting to starting to chip away at it here. There were no explosions for the day, and that was kind of disappointing. I was hoping that I'd at least have a cherry bomb or two. Um, yeah, this is another shot of the VZ Dam. Uh, the excavators were working over here on this area. And this was the, the day of the removal, the day it started. We had the, we had the ceremony and this was a, uh, nobody knew that this young tribal member was gonna throw a birch bark canoe in and paddle around for the cameras. So uh, I think this picture actually made it into the New York Times that day. <clears throat> Yeah, another shot, chipping away. This is the Beasy Dam. And uh, the aerial shot, uh, as, the, as the impoundment, uh, you know, this, this is the dam here as they're taking it out. So they, they uh, did some deconstruction over here to drain this part of it. And then they opened up this, 
this side over here on the east side to start draining the impoundment and uh, a lot of the uh, previous uh, <coughs> structure. This was an industrial site for a long time. There was an old uh, legacy dam, what we call the legacy dam uh, up here, which was a dam that had become flooded and overtopped when they built the main VZ dam. Uh, and so uh, we were aware that this was there and we had to do a little bit of modification here to uh, make sure that uh, fish, you know, it provided adequate fish passage. And another benefit uh, is the recreational whitewater canoeing folks. Um, the Penobscot Nation hosted the National Whitewater Champions for three years in a row uh, following those dam removals. The whitewater folks were pretty excited about having some new whitewater to paddle. So they uh, ended up uh, actually extending the, uh, the race for three years, which turned out to be a pretty good economic boom for the Old Town region. Kind of a side benefit of the project. Uh, it was primarily a fish and energy project, but it had some pretty neat side benefits. Yeah, and here's uh, before and after the VZ Dam. Um, so the powerhouse was over here and where the powerhouse was, the uh, they built a kind of a little recreational area here now and the town of VZ has formed a uh, conservation committee and they uh, did a uh, put, uh, the trust did put in a little kind of a little park here for the town uh, where this powerhouse was. And they have a little uh, <coughs> kind of a primitive uh, boat launch down below here that was put in. Uh, moving up, this is the Milford Dam. Like I said, this dam will uh, stay in place, has stayed in place. Um, that's the powerhouse. And the over here to the right is where they were building the, uh, the new fish lift. And so there's a viewing window in the fish lift where um, there's a, it's set up so you can go out outside now. It was inside, but with COVID and with uh, uh, security measures, the, they've moved the uh, viewing for the public to outside in the parking lot. They have a kiosk set up out there with a viewing window and anybody can stop by anytime and check out to see what kind of fish are happened to be moving through at the time. So this was a great shot because it shows uh, most of the species. You know, you've got shad in here and probably, these are probably some alewives uh, and shad, Atlantic salmon and a, a lamprey. And this was the final count for last year, uh, which was a pretty good run for salmon. It was uh, the biggest run since 2011, I believe. Uh, but uh, the real uh, the real prize here are the the alewives, the river herring, over two million, uh, from near zero to over two million in a few years, has been uh, fantastic. As I mentioned earlier, they're really a keystone species, and um, you know there are folks uh, that are involved on with the the offshore fishery, uh, the ocean fisheries, have, uh, folks have talked about the collapse of the near shore cod fishery, uh, probably being a result of the lack of um, young alewife coming out of the river systems. So we're hoping that uh, by restoring uh, the alewife runs, that it's going to have some uh, some benefits down, you know, down on the uh, down in the ocean as well. So again, the Howland. This was the third project. 
So this is the main stem of the Penobscot River going up this way. This is where the Piscataquis subdrainage comes in from the west. Uh, so the Howland Dam was uh, right here, is right here. And that's what it looked like, the site uh, looked like uh, prior to any construction. This was also an old industrial site. There was a tannery, uh, big tannery building over here. And we worked with the town and helped them uh, put together a, a uh, Brownfields grant to do some site remediation and to redevelop uh, that site. So the town has put in a, um, a park over there and a boat ramp. And this is during the construction uh, phase. Here's the, the dam itself. Um, and this is the, the route where we built the bypass channel. <clears throat> Yeah, a few shots uh, during construction. This uh, bypass channel was uh, quite a bit more extensive than I originally envisioned when we first started talking about it. It was uh, quite extensive, as you can see. And this is what it looked like uh, right after construction. Uh, now, a few years later, this has all been revegetated. So the, you know, this project also, you know, we're addressing the lower part of the watershed and getting migratory fish uh, up past a few more dams and up into the various spawning habitats. It also spawned, sorry for the, the pun, <laughs> it spawned a bunch of um, work on uh, road crossings in the upper part of the watershed, up in the headwaters. Um, you know, during the log logging days, uh, lots of roads were built, uh, logging roads, and and they often didn't uh, really pay a lot of attention to fish passage needs. Uh, a lot of hanging culverts and a lot of uh, bridges, old logging bridges that collapsed, and uh, so there's been a, a massive effort uh, with a lot of people and a lot of. Uh, entities and agencies are working together um, to do, um, you know, to assess these conditions of a lot of these crossings and to, to go in and uh, work with the landowners to make these improvements in fish passage. So there was a lot of studies uh, done around this project. The university folks got pretty excited because uh, we, uh, announced the project five years before we uh, actually took out the dams. So there was uh, quite a bit of time for various scientists to gather uh, pre-dam removal baseline data uh, in a number of disciplines uh, and then be able to go back um, you know, after the dams are removed and make some comparisons. So they looked at all of this stuff, fish migration and habitat use, <clears throat> fish structure of the fish community, physical response, geomorphology and changes in water quality. Um, this is my final slide. It just really shows, you know, the, the range of partnerships that came into this project in one way or another. And this project has got uh, international recognition. We've had uh, folks from many foreign countries come visit us. Uh, I had, uh, for example, we had a uh, 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 writer for the largest daily newspaper in Japan uh, visiting the project, wondering how we pulled this off. And um, we had a contingent from Korea. And I think there were some Indonesian folks. And we worked also with uh, the Maori indigenous groups uh, from New Zealand. 
they have similar issues that they're dealing with uh, in their homeland in New Zealand. Uh, so there was a lot of talk about, you know, this model, using this model in other places and, uh, you know, using it as a model. And I think that, you know, this was a very unique project. It, it came together as a result of a very unique set of circumstances involving many uh, diverse partners. And, um, you know, I think the, the lesson that I tell that really the most important thing that can be learned from this is to, you know, to take whatever time it takes to, to get to yes, make sure that, uh, you know, you've got all the interests covered and you've got everybody at the table and that you really sit down and just take whatever time it takes and be patient. Put, your, put yourself in the other people's shoes, understand what their needs are and um, understand that there's, you know, if you really desire to have a better future, then the, the collaboration is worth it. It's, you know, it's difficult sometimes and you hit uh, roadblocks and bumps in the road, but um, you know, you persevere and good things can happen. It took us about three years just to get to a conceptual agreement project. So I don't know how we're doing with time, Julia, but that's the end of my slideshow and I'd certainly be happy to try to answer anybody's questions. Great, thank you so much. Um, do you want to maybe stop sharing your screen and then both of our faces will show up a little bigger? For sure. Um, so I encourage you all to type any questions that you have in the chat and I'll ask them at this time. Um, we had one person who typed something in while you were speaking, um, asking if you have any comments on the DMR's announcement last week about the setback in the project to remove two more dams on the Kennebec River. So I don't know how if you're keeping up with um, keeping up with what's going on on the Kennebec. Yeah, I have been following the Kennebec stuff, and I was pretty excited when the state, um, you know, put out the management plan. Uh, and unfortunately, I, you know, I feel bad that, uh, the, you know, the, the company reacted in the way it did and played a little bit of offense. And um, I guess we'll see what happens. <laughs> uh, it is very disappointing that the, the state uh, did pull back uh, from their, you know, their original plan. Right. Okay. And then we had another question about how the project was funded, the Penobscot River restoration. How was that funded? Yeah, um, roughly half and half public and private monies. We had a private uh, fundraising campaign. Uh, you know, we had put together a committee uh, and they uh, did a fantastic job. Uh, raising money through, uh, you know, outreach with uh, various parties. Um, it was a, it was quite an effort. And then we also, um, you know, worked very closely with the congressional delegation and uh, got their support to help access, uh, you know, agency grants and cooperative agreements. And so yeah, it was about it was a roughly a $63 million project so far, and just about half private and half public. Great. Um, there's another question about, in addition to the fish populations, in what other populations have you seen a significant change? Um, ospreys, I'm seeing more ospreys. Used to be osprey nests all along the river, and I, the ospreys had pretty much disappeared. Uh, I'm assuming from the um, use of DDT and the eggshell thinning uh, debacle, but um, they're starting to come back. I remember seeing my first uh, osprey on the river again a few years ago. Um, eagles, eagles are doing well. They're 
they're enjoying their new diets. <laughs> Yeah, and I imagine everything else, you know. The, I think uh, it's important, really, to emphasize the importance of having the this keystone species in the system. I mean, before the alewives were here, you could uh, you could pretty much follow the salmon smolts just by following the birds, the, the cormorants. It was. You know, they would gather above the dams by the hundreds and just gorge themselves uh, with the outgoing uh, smolts, salmon smolts. And, um, they used to joke saying that the, um, the comrades could read the license plate numbers on the stocking trucks, on DMR stocking <laughs> trucks and follow them around. But, um, you know, since the alewives have been in the system over the past few years, we just don't see these comrades congregating uh, like they used to when the salmon smolts were on their way out. They're much more spread out. And uh, yeah. Great, thanks. Um, there's another question. What are the prospects for removing additional dams on the Penobscot? Are you still working? Is there more you'd like to see? Well, I don't know. I don't know. That's a that's a tough question. There's a lot of smaller dam removals, like I said, up in the upper watershed. A lot of the old log driving dams and stuff are being addressed. Um, as far as dams on the main stem, there is uh, uh, the West Enfield Dam was just relicensed, and that that was rebuilt in the late 1980s with the state of the art fishway. Uh, so that's not as bad. Uh, some of the other dams. Uh, and then there's another dam that's, uh, um, well, the Mattisian Dam actually is the one that just got relicensed. That's up above. The West Enfield Dam is uh, just starting uh, to go into relicensing now. And then there's a whole slew of dams uh, up on the west branch of the Penobscot that are coming up for relicensing. And uh, I haven't heard a lot of discussion yet about possible negotiating um, you know an agreement uh, another agreement with the company that could potentially lead to a dam removal but um, I'm glad there's younger kids coming up there's there's uh, new generations and more dams to work on and John's going to retire soon <laughs> <All right. laughs> um, and this is kind of a similar question but are there other rivers in Maine where you would like to see dams removed other than the Penobscot and the Kennebec? Um, yeah, I think there's been some efforts down on the Presumpscot as well that um, I think, uh, you know, there's a bigger human population down that way and it would be great for folks down in the Portland area to be having some opportunities to, to fish for salmon in the Presumpscot. River. By the way, um, back in the uh, early 1800s, there's records of Penobscot leadership uh, traveling by canoe to the colonial government in Boston, complaining about the first dams being built uh, on the Presumpscot River, the first dams in Maine and blocking the, uh, the fish runs. So. We've been at it for a while. Yeah, <laughs> no problem for a long time. Um, another question that asks, do you foresee having a native person as secretary of the interior will improve getting the federal government to help with similar restoration projects? Well, it certainly won't hurt. Uh, you know, Secretary Holland uh, gets it. Uh, she understands the need for balance as well. She works on the energy side as well, uh, renewable type energy stuff, and she does a lot of solar, you know, solar and wind with the tribes. But um, it can't hurt at all. I think, uh, you know, it's also important who who gets put in there for the various assistant secretary positions. Like there'll be the assistant secretary for fish, wildlife, and parks and there'll be an assistant secretary for Indian affairs. Uh, and those will be the key positions. Those will have uh, direct oversight of the various federal agencies like the Fish and Wildlife Service and 
the uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs. So those assistant secretary uh, appointments would be very important. Yeah, okay. Um, another question asks, can you describe the political process of making all this happen? Um, yeah, we, you know, we uh, really uh, talked a lot with our political leadership at the beginning of this and uh, made sure that um, we were going in a direction that they could support and wanted to make sure we were addressing, you know, uh, the concerns about uh, making sure that all of the communities along the river, the municipalities, all have a voice uh, in this project and that uh, everybody remains whole, you know. Uh, you know, with these dams coming out, for instance, there was a, a paper mill in Old Town where we committed to uh, rebuild their water intake system since it had been previously located in the area where the impoundment was. Uh, and so uh, we did that. And so we really, you know, really made a very conscious and thorough effort to make sure that we were addressing all of the impacts. Great. Another question that I that I like is, what is your favorite thing to do in the continent now? <laughs> wow, that's a great question. I just love to be on it, whatever season it is, whether I'm, I don't do a lot of recreational paddling. Most of my paddling is to get somewhere to do something, like to gather things or go hunting or fishing. Uh, so that's that's kind of what I do. I'm kind of descendant from one of the uh, branches of the tribal uh, tree, if you will. That the various clans and families of the Penobscot can basically be kind of divided up into like three big roots. You have the uh, warriors. Uh, and now they're more like the diplomats and the governance people that negotiate. You have the cultural uh, knowledge keepers, the cultural folks that uh, protect uh, all of the tribe's uh, cultural integrity. And there's overlap, of course, between these three routes. The third route is kind of the uh, providing, providing the sustenance, the gathering you know, the hunting uh, families, fishing families, and, and that sort of thing. Of course, they're not black and white lines between these, these roots. These roots interconnect with each other and go together, but that's kind of a general rough uh, kind of genealogy, genealogical kind of breakdown. So I, I'm from this, descendant from this family of hunting and fishing. My great-grandfather was uh, Willie Ketchum, uh, he was a uh, fairly infamous uh, guide on the West Branch log drives. He's also the guy that built the uh, sporting camps at uh, Namakanta Lake on the West Branch. He, mm -hmm. he uh, ran his guiding operation out of Namakanta Lakes. He built the log cabin up there. And he also was a foreman on the West Branch log drive. I guess he was quite a guy. He, um, he guided folks like... Um, a couple of his clients were um, the author, Mark Twain. He took Mark Twain up to Katahdin, I guess. And then he also guided uh, a governor, state governor, uh, Hannibal Hamlin, I think. Hmm. Wow. Uh, uh, else Rough Riders, too. <laughs> Actually, would you talk a little bit more about the Penobscot um, traditional you know the connection connection to the river and and how imp what importance it's played in the, in the yeah so you know it's yeah. just i mean you know i wouldn't be here today as a as a descendant if it wasn't for the penobscot river it's it's allowed the tribe to survive for thousands of years ten thousand years there's archaeology sites up in the upper watershed that they date back to 
you know, 9,500 years before present. And so that's a long time to develop a, a reciprocal relationship. You know, all of the needs were met uh, because of the watershed for that very long period of time. So a lot of people feel that we have a very strong spiritual connection to that place, that sense of place. You know, our ancestors' bones are buried there. Um, and it's just, um, it's a real, very, very strong sense of place. Many tribal members uh, feel we have a reciprocal relationship, you know, to do what we can for the river. They feel the river as a living, breathing, you know, entity in and of itself. And um, we have a duty, a st an inherent stewardship duty to improve her health. And um, that's, you know, that's a very strong uh, element of how many tribal members look at the river. Yeah, great. Thank you. And that actually leads into a question that I was meaning to ask you, which is thinking, thinking broadly, what do you see as the big challenges for the Penobscot Nation? And what, are, what if anything, can land trusts do to to assist in those challenges? I uh, think that, you know, there's a lot of challenges, same challenges that a lot of folks have. Um, you know, providing we don't have a tax base, we don't tax our, our folks, but we do have the responsibility to provide all of the same services that municipalities provide. Um, so that's, that's always uh, challenging fundraising. Um, and um, I think um, one thing that is happening now is there is a quite an effort. It's called the First Light Learning Journey. And I would encourage um, folks to uh, take a look at that and uh, consider maybe, um, you know, taking some of their, it's a, it's a great program for doing a lot of outreach and uh, helping people to understand the important connection between uh, tribal people and the resource, the lands. And through that, uh, that first light learning journey process, it brings together uh, all of the tribes in Maine and many of the large landowners, many of the NGO conservation groups, many of the land trusts. And, uh, you know, we talk about working together and there's there's uh, some elements of traditional ecological knowledge held within the tribes that provide uh, historical or even modern day uh, ecological, uh, you know, knowledge of certain places. And um, so some, you know, the tri some, land, uh, large landowners have, through this process of bringing folks together, have started um, making provisions to give, uh, like, as an example, bas tribal basket makers um, access to see if there's any basket ash that may be available on their lands. Uh, sweet grass is an issue, too, as, uh, uh, you know, the, the tribes continue to practice making baskets and sweet grass and brown ash are the two main components. And um, sweet grass is getting harder and harder to find places to gather. Landowners are buying up, you know, lands and that were previously uh, allowed for tribal members to be able to go and gather a few blades of sweet grass. And so anything that land trusts can do to, to help uh, you know, to work with tribes to develop these these relationships, they can be really uh, mutually beneficial, I think. And there's a lot of discussion going on uh, through the first light learning journey uh, process now. Thank you for that question. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, I think, well, it's 726. I'll read one more from the chat. Um, there was someone who asked, any comments on changes to water quality due to dam removal? Uh, yeah, definitely. We're, um, 
we do these um, um, looking at the insect communities. We put out these rock baskets in the springtime and the insects colonize them and we key them out at the end of the summer. And I really like that way of uh, judging water quality because you're measuring directly the level of aquatic life that a stretch of river will support, you know, in conjunction with the chemical and physical parameters that we measure. But I really like that method. And yes, we are seeing uh, different, uh, different colonies of insects now in these areas uh, where the dams have been removed, seeing more of the caddis fly types. And, and I'm not an entomologist, so I can't speak to the specific <laughs> species there, but uh, I'm told they are seeing some changes that they would expect to see going from a kind of a lacustrian, almost lacustrian type of, uh, you know, uh, system to, uh, to back to a riverine system. Yeah. Yeah, great. so it's exciting. Yeah, it is. Well, great. I just wanna thank you for joining us um, and talking with us. I think it was really interesting. I'm sure other people enjoyed it as well. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me and enjoy the rest of your evening, everybody. Yeah, you too. Have Thank a good you. night, everyone. Yeah. Bye-bye.